Hey guys, welcome to Solar React Talk. Today I'm going to be reacting to a video requested by Miguel Angel Ortega Lascano. It's called Complete History and Law of Overwatch, uh, created by TGN, the YouTube channel TGN. And remember, if you want to check out the original video as well as TGN YouTube channel, uh, the links are in the description below. Yes, this is in relation to my Overwatch reactions and I'm done with the playlist of cinematics and now I'm just going to be reacting to the history and the law of Overwatch. Um, I don't know what's next after this in terms of Overwatch. If there's any more content um, revolving around Overwatch, then you know you can send me suggestions in the comment section. But I think after this video, I think I've reached uh the end for now um yeah so next week i'll see i'll see what's going to cover up the spot but yeah let's continue on with the complete history three two one go hello everyone mox is here today we're revisiting the complete history and lore of overwatch we thought it was time to make some new additions to our complete history and lore of the overwatch universe series in order to reflect this including the newest reveals of dr liao echo and how the stage is finally set for the sequel overwatch 2. now join us as we re-enter the complete history and lore of overwatch <laughs> At some point many years from now, Earth was enjoying an age of peace and prosperity. It was a golden age of technology. There was even a science facility called the Horizon Lunar Base that was constructed on the moon by the company Luchang Interstellar. However, the most stunning breakthrough was the advent of advanced robotics with highly complex artificial intelligence. These advanced robots were, of course, the Omnics. The creation of Omnics boosted the world's prosperity and economy through manufacturing as the use of Omnics became widespread all over the world. The Om okay, all right, let me just get this straight. So, the Omnics were created and they were given artificial intelligence. They didn't, uh, you know, evolve naturally with artificial intelligence. They weren't self-aware of their own existence through, you know, natural progression. This was something that was already pre-installed in them, you know, the artificial intelligence side. Um, now I'm asking myself, why would they do that? Why would they give these machines artificial intelligence? Why would they allow them uh, to have, you know, the thought and understanding that they exist and that they are not just tools that they are alive and they have rights and you know they can't just be taken away from them now because they understand that they exist so why why did they give them artificial intelligence why not just make them as rudimentary as possible you know hmm Omnics were built in large factories called Omniums, created by the Omnica Corporation, and they were found in all the major metropolitan areas on the planet. In order to better understand the creation of the Omnics, we have to explore one Dr. Mina Liao. Before she became one of the legendary founding members of Overwatch, Dr. Liao was one of the top experts in the world of robotics and developing artificial intelligence. Dr. Liao moved forth with development of the Omnics with good intentions. She wanted to help make the world a better place she had you can make the world a better place without giving the machines artificial intelligence they don't need to be self-aware you know you can teach them the algorithms the, the 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 basic processes or purpose that they are meant for but you don't need to give them the, the notion of thinking for themselves the moment you do that is the moment they will start rebelling against the creators i mean Hasn't Dr. Uh, what's her name again? Mina Liao watched The Terminator or, you know, all these other sci-fi movies <laughs> where we create machines and they betray us or they, they turn against us uh, and they have their various reasons why they do it. But the fact is that they do it and then they call for the extinction of the entire human race, you know? No idea the terror her creation would wreak upon the world. 
The exact point in the imagined future of Overwatch that the Omnic Crisis happens is unknown, but it's approximately 2050, or 30 years from now. At some point, the Omnica Corporation was exposed for fraud. The Corporation and its Omniums were shut down. However, after the shutdown of the Omniums, the factories were reactivated with a new purpose, mankind's destruction. And because Omniums were built all over the world in major cities, the entire planet was at risk. What is known about the Omniums is that they were built with automated construction machinery and self-improving software algorithms. The Omniums started creating legions of bastion robots as their standard military units. Om that is frightening. That is extremely frightening. The fact that the Omniums are, you know, self-sufficient, they can uh, produce units without any input from humans. That is very scary. Uh, I think in this future, people have left machines to automate themselves completely, 100%. And that's also an issue. You know, not only giving the machines artificial intelligence, but, uh, you know, cutting out the human oversight. That is very important, especially when dealing with machines that can think for themselves. Um, yeah. Hmm. Nix could also hijack existing technology, such as large military titan walkers. Reporter Olympia Shaw labeled the Omnic Crisis as one of the greatest threats to the survival of our species since the Cold War of the 20th century. But she was wrong. Unlike the Cold War, battles were waged during the Omnic Crisis, and many innocent people died. Different countries responded to the Omnic Crisis in different ways. Uh, I don't think that's entirely correct. Uh, during the Cold War, there were some proxy wars being held across the world. You know, those who were in support of or those who were supported by either the, the, the Russian government or those that were supported by the U.S. government. You know, there were proxy wars, there were civil wars, uh, there were even some genocides. So, yeah, it's not entirely correct. It's just that we didn't have a global war. Not like what's happening with the Omni crisis. Yeah. Russia produced large human piloted mechs called the Sviatogors to fight the Omnics. The United States initiated a soldier enhancement program, a classified program that sought to shape soldiers into perfect specimens with enhanced superhuman speed, strength, and agility. In Germany, the J08 produced what was known as the Crusader Armor. A modern day order of knights formed the Crusaders to protect Germany on the front lines. However, no individual group was able to successfully defeat the Omnic threat. Okay, all right. Uh, let me just write this down here. You know, if the United States of America and Germany worked together, like in a joint venture, they could have created their own Spartan program. You know, they have the armor, the Germans have built the armor, and then the Americans have their super soldiers, you know? Or maybe something like uh, the Astartes from uh, Warhammer 40K. So yeah, <laughs> this is interesting. This is very interesting. Uh, the Americans creating superhumans and the Germans having uh, power armor. And the Russians had their Titan machines. Yeah, hmm, okay. World governments were failing to effectively combat the Omnic threat, and as a result, the United Nations sought to form an international task force made up of elite soldiers. Soldiers who showed remarkable ingenuity and acclamation to the new type of warfare wrought by the Omnics. Soldiers like Jack Morrison and Gabriel Reyes, two Americans from the Classified Soldier Enhancement Program. Others included Anna Amari, an elite sniper and marksman from Egypt, Torbjorn Lindholm, a brilliant engineer and weapons designer from Sweden, and and also the Singaporean scientist who helped develop the Omnics, Dr. Mina Liao. Jack Morrison was the one who personally invited Dr. Mina Liao to join the team. She was taken aback by the offer, not understanding why she should be someone to join Overwatch, considering how she helped create the Omnics in the first place. But Morrison responded, who better to help us fight them? As a part of Overwatch, Dr. Liao would now put her scientific expertise to good use to stop her mechanical creations. There I agree. I agree with that uh, uh, um, uh, decision that uh, Jack Morrison made there. Definitely. Who better to defeat the Onmix than the person who created them? Definitely.
There is also a sixth member invited to join the team, one Baldrick von Adler of Germany. Von Adler was a member of the elite Crusader Knights, who were stationed at Eichenwald to push back invading Omnic forces. During the Omnic attack, however, von Adler was critically injured. Though the Crusaders and German military were able to eventually push back the Omnic offensive, Baldrick von Adler succumbed to his injuries. But prior to his death, von Adler offered his Medal of Invitation for Overwatch to fellow Crusader Reinhard Wilhelm. Reinhardt would join Overwatch in Von Adler's stead, becoming Overwatch's sixth and final founding member. With Los Angeles-born Gabriel Reyes picked as the original team leader, Overwatch was born. Overwatch became the original team leader was Gabriel Reyes and not Jack Morrison. Interesting. I wonder when did they change positions? When did Jack Morrison become the leader and uh, Reyes... He became the leader of Black Watch, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. The light humanity needed in its darkest hour, conducting highly classified missions and raids that managed to surgically take out Omnic Central Command and protocols. Omnic armies became inoperable. Most of the Bastion combat units were destroyed. For the surviving Omnics, humanity was able to forge a peace treaty. The Omnic Crisis had finally come to an end. However, while the victory was won for humanity, the toll and sacrifice on the world was great. The I don't think they should have had peace with them. Um, I think they should have all been deactivated. Every single one of them. Uh, they are too dangerous to be left alone and, you know, be given pieces of land somewhere across the world. No, no. We should try and make sure that this never happens again. Um, and that means destroying the very things we've created. I understand that, you know, there will be some who will disagree with my uh, with my decision on that and, you know, say that, yes, they, they are alive and they have the right to exist. <sighs> but I'm not going to take that chance. I just, I can't do that. No. The world was forever changed and heavily scarred by the Omnic Crisis. A financial crisis in the war's aftermath was only the tip of the iceberg. The Australian government attempted to forge a peace with the Omnics following the war, granting them land in central Australia and even the country's Omnium. But this infuriated a number of residents of the Australian Outback, who formed an insurrection group called the Australian Liberation Front. This group spearheaded an effort to destroy Australia's Omnium, a sabotage operation of the Omnium Omnium's fusion core caused a massive explosion. As a result, the region became an irradiated wasteland of rubble and wreckage. Countries and cities such as Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, suffered heavy bombardment during the Omnic Crisis. Rio went through massive economic upheaval. Though India's population was greatly displaced as a result of the Omnic Crisis, it also gave rise to the Vishkar Corporation, a company specializing in hard light architecture, a technology that allows the creation of solid matter from light sources. The Vishkar Corporation used this technology to build a new cultural and metropolitan center in India called Utopia to house the country's displaced populace. And Oh, well, okay, wait, wait, before we continue with the Visca Corporation, <coughs> before we continue on with that, uh, let me just say that, you know, what happened in Australia, I think the government didn't really communicate with the people of Australia, telling them what they want to do. And they just did it without the consent of the people. And the people, you know, rose up, they made their own liberation fronts, and yeah, they destroyed the... Uh, on on Mia's factory yeah and like i said before like these things you can't you can't give them a reprieve you can't give peace um yeah i'm still with my decision about destroying all of them or deactivating and then dismantling everything you know um yeah they're just too dangerous they're just too dangerous and the Viscar Corporation creating physical matter out of light sources. That's crazy. That's that's technology beyond <laughs> beyond my wildest dreams and imagination, really. Wow, that's like the stuff of I don't know, like aliens or something. <laughs> wow, wow. I mean you could literally recreate existence on this earth 
if you could master something like that, master that type of technology. Uh, the very forms of production and extraction of mineral resources on the planet will radically change. We won't need to mine anything anymore. We won't need to uh, build things with factories anymore. We could literally create it out of light and it will become physical matter and we'll be able to use it. We will be able to create a utopia for humanity. Truly. Um, what that utopia entails for humanity, like, you know, in terms of work, uh, employment, economic growth, I don't know. <laughs> don't, don't ask me about that question. I'm just saying that, you know, the, the end result of something like this would create a utopian society, I think. But because it's a, a corporation that created this technology, I don't know if they are in the interest of humanity or the interest of their shareholders. So, yeah. Mexico, most of the country's infrastructure and power grid were shattered. The Omni crisis created a period of literal darkness that the local population referred to as La Medianoche, which translates to the midnight. Many children were orphaned as a result of the war, including future hacker and talent operative Olivia Colomar, aka Sombra. Another corporation given prominence due to the Omni crisis was Lumerico, which built a new network of power plants to replace Mexico's infrastructure and provide clean, affordable energy. During the Omnic crisis, Russia actually managed to defeat many Omnics on its own. The Siberian Omnium was shut down, however, the surrounding region and much of Russia was left severely devastated as a result. One year it was shut down, but was it dismantled? Because that's what happened last time. They shut down the, 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 the factory, yes. But then it reactivated itself again and it was creating the Omni bastions and all other forms of Omni robots. So was it shut down and dismantled or was it just shut down? Yeah. You guys got to be permanent about these things. You can't just do it halfway and expect things to be okay. No. Permanent. Meaning you must remove everything, dismantle everything. You know, and the fusion plant, I don't know what you're going to do with it. Maybe dig a big hole and and throw sand on top of it. You know, like how we deal with nuclear waste. Do that. Do that. Young child forced to endure growing up through the devastation of post-war Siberia was Alexandra Zarianova, who would later become the elite Russian soldier known as Zarya. While the country was devastated by the war, Russia managed to exploit a revamped mechanized labor industry. The corporation that benefited the most from the rebuilding process was Volskaya Industries. While the war was won thanks to Overwatch, the group became far from obsolete. In fact, Overwatch ushered in a new age, a better age, the Age of Heroes. And thus, humanity finally entered its new dawn that was spearheaded by Overwatch. After winning the war, Overwatch became the group at the forefront of maintaining the world's peace and stability. It was a new age of heroes. Terrorists, rogue omnics, and dictators were no match for Overwatch. Overwatch even oversaw rescue operations and rebuilding initiatives for natural disasters. For decades, Overwatch prospered thanks to new members such as the brilliant medical operative Dr. Angela Ziegler, who became Overwatch's head of medical research. This new dawn of humanity was an age of heroism, peace, prosperity, and exploration. The positive wave in society for Overwatch was so strong that those born in this age were dubbed the Overwatch Generation. One such child who was born was Fariha Amari, the daughter of one of Overwatch's founders, Anna Amari. While Gabriel Reyes was the Overwatch Task Force's de facto leader during the Omnic Crisis, the UN declared Jack Morrison as the first official commander of the new Overwatch. Despite Reyes being a more experienced senior officer, Morrison was named leader due to his supposed penchant for bringing out the best in those around him. It was during the Omnic Crisis that Morrison ultimately helped mold the eclectic group into an elite, diverse unit and a cohesive fighting force. However, the passing over of Reyes as commander was the catalyst of a permanent rift between Morrison and Reyes that would create ripples into the future. After joining Overwatch, Reinhardt and weapons engineer Torbjorn Lindholm formed a close friendship. However, the friendship would soon be given a baptism by fire. Close to 24 years before the present time of Overwatch, the Overwatch strike team took part in a mission called Operation White Dome. 
The mission was headed up by Captain Anna Amari. Anna and her team, consisting of Torbjorn, Reinhardt, and a private first class Emre Sarioglu, were deployed to the outskirts of Istanbul for a routine insertion. The team was ambushed by hostile Omnic forces. All the Omnics were subdued in the firefight, but both Reinhardt and Torbjorn were injured. Reinhardt did save Torbjorn's life, but Torbjorn lost one of his arms and an eye during the fight. As an expression of gratitude, Torbjorn insisted that Reinhardt not only Oh, Regita, oh, look how cute she is. <laughs> ...may become the godfather of his firstborn daughter, but also choose her name. Reinhardt agreed, naming the girl Regita. Overwatch grew in power and influence in the ensuing years under Morrison's leadership. The organization grew beyond paramilitary and global peacekeeping efforts, sparking innovations into fields of science, engineering, space exploration, and medicine. Meanwhile, Reyes was granted leadership of a covert ops division for Overwatch. This covert ops unit was called Blackwatch. The aftermath of the Omnic Crisis saw the rise of a group of outlaws known as the Deadlock Gang. The group was founded by four outlaws, among them were Elizabeth Caledonia, Calamity, Ash, and another local ruffian by the name of Jesse McCree. Together, the group of outlaws made a name for themselves in the criminal underworld. Their actions even put them at odds with criminal groups throughout the American Southwest. Eventually, the activities of the Deadlock Gang gained the attention of Overwatch. McCree was taking part in illicit weapons and military hardware deals when Gabriel Reyes and Blackwatch led a sting to thwart Deadlock. At this point, McCree was given an ultimatum, join Blackwatch or go to prison. McCree chose the former, thus Gabriel Reyes took the young outlaw under his wing and became a mentor for him under the Blackwatch banner. And okay, uh, let me just pause right here. This is a concern for me. The fact that Overwatch or Blackwatch can, you know, um, acquire new personnel, for instance, a criminal. They can acquire a criminal without due process uh, in the justice system of a particular country. Uh, for instance, this, I think that was like in the United States of America. This man should have been apprehended by the police. He should have been uh, taken to prison awaiting his uh, court date where he would present him, where they would present him in court, where the judge would, you know, go through all the information and you know from there on the judge will determine what you know what's going to be his sentence and how long will he be staying in incarceration or something like that you know the justice system that process literally overwatch or blackwatch just up upended that process and decided that you know we will be the judge and executioner of this person of this particular person and his fate now belongs in our uh, uh, decision making you know and that is wrong that is definitely wrong you are heroes yes but you should be heroes that um, follow the rules and the laws of the particular countries that you're in and the United Nations as a whole you cannot just unilaterally decide on things like this um, because now we're blurring the lines between what your organization is meant to do and who you're supposed to represent and uh, uh, the ones that are meant to have the oversight over your organization you know and I also blame the governments of uh, the United Nations uh, you know the, the different countries I blame them because they are giving all of this responsibility all of this power to overwatch you know for them to be the world's police you know, without any oversight, without any control, uh, these guys are just accumulating more power, more authority. They're, get, they're getting funding when these kind of things should have been focused on the police force or the police service of these particular countries. You know, you have to rebuild those institutions, make them strong enough so that they can be the ones policing uh, their countries, policing their societies and making sure that it's safe not to depend on overwatch to do everything for you because the moment you do that is the moment you're giving away your responsibilities as a government uh, of the people and that is an issue for me and you know that, that that's i think that's also contributed uh to the end of this overwatch uh, uh because they have 
they have literally become the very thing that they've been fighting against. They were becoming corrupt. And this is uh, a clear indication of that, you know, how Reyes can just take a criminal into Black Watch without any due process in terms of this criminal going into the justice system of the country, you know, that he was operating in. So, yeah, um, I think Overwatch should have been something like Interpol. They should have really like drastically changed their jurisdiction and the way they operate. They should have been something akin to, to Interpol and then that would be better, I think. Not what they're doing here. Yeah. So the ranks of Blackwatch grew, with Jesse McCree joining the team. Another member of Blackwatch was Genji Shimada of the Shimada crime family in Japan. Genji came from a long line of Japanese gangsters, but he was not interested in a life of crime. This led to conflict and an eventual fight with Genji's older brother Hanzo Shimada, who was tasked with eliminating his brother by the dissenting Shimada council members. Following the fight, Hanzo believed that he killed his brother Genji, but the shame of the act got the better of Hanzo. Of his own free will, Hanzo left the life of the Shimada clan behind, and miraculously, Genji also survived. With the help of Dr. Angela Ziegler, aka Mercy, Genji's body was transformed into a cyborg, and he joined Blackwatch under Gabriel Reyes's leadership. In the years following the Omnic Crisis, there was a great change throughout the world. As mentioned previously, the Vishkar Corporation in India developed the radical technology called Hardlight. One of the emerging architects and scientists of Hardlight was Satya Vaswani, who became one of the lead architects for the Hardlight City Utopia. Vaswani was later dubbed Symmetra, and she sought to help spread the Vishkar Corporation influence across the globe. However, the emergence of these mega corporations wasn't all peaches and cream for the rest of the world. There wasn't much improvement for Central Australia after the destruction of the Omnium. In this blighted wasteland of what remained of the outback, the survivors called themselves Junkers. The Junkers formed a barbarous cutthroat society. It was from this cutthroat society where the infamous criminal Jameson Fox, aka Junkrat, was born and raised. About 20 years before the current time of Overwatch, South Korea developed a new type of mechanized armor drone unit called Mecha, which were built to protect cities from a colossal Omnic robot that would wreak havoc across the country after emerging from the East China Sea. The conflict would constantly end in stalemates with the robot every few years. After a time, the government sought to recruit professional gamers to pilot the mecha suits to battle the colossal Omnic. One such candidate was Hannah Song, aka Diva. Diva became an excellent mecha pilot thanks in part to her excellent skills as a championship gamer. Was Diva part of Overwatch? Or, you know, was she just part of an, uh, the organization protecting South Korea during that time? I'm just wondering. Yeah. A number of years after the Omnic Crisis, Overwatch would continue to bring on new members, including Winston the Gorilla. The Horizon Lunar Colony took part in an experimental project on genetically enhanced gorillas, and at least one hamster. This was primarily to test the effects of prolonged stays in outer space. There were at least 28 gorilla subjects for the experiment, and subject number 28 was future Overwatch member Winston. Unfortunately for the scientists at the Horizon Lunar Base, some of the gorillas began growing adverse reactions to the gene therapy. A few of the gorillas were even becoming known troublemakers, injuring some of the base's staff. Eventually, some of the test subjects started a gorilla uprising. The gorillas tricked the scientists into checking the malfunction in the airlock on the base, and as a result, the scientists were all jettisoned outside the base and into the vacuum of space. Victor um, what I don't understand is why are they experimenting on primates in space? Why are they doing that? They don't need to do that. You don't need to take them all, all the way up to space to experiment on them. This brings forth questions in my mind. Why are they doing this? For what purpose are they doing these experiments uh, on these primates? You know? You don't need to hide it. Because that's clearly how I see it here. They're trying to hide what they're trying to do, uh, uh, experimenting on these primates, all the way on the moon. Really, there could have been far more cost-effective measures uh, in experimenting on animals on Earth. You don't need to do it in space. So I'm assuming that these guys were breaking international laws. And they needed a place to do all of this where there, there is no 
um, uh, uh, criticism or there's going to be possible um, you know law breaking on earth where that might result in their scientists getting arrested or overwatch is going to come there and you know bomb up the place and say that you guys are all under arrest for breaking uh, international laws or something like that you know so i I, st I just don't understand why are they doing it on a moon base in space why Horius, the gorillas decided to stay at the base and take over. Specimen 28, Winston, however, decided to escape. Winston fashioned his own rocket to escape from Horizon, and Specimen 8, Hammond, the hamster, also engineered his own escape pod that he managed to attach to Winston's rocket with a tether. The two managed- Sorry, ha uh, the primates and the hamster, sorry. To get the heck out of Dodge. However, Hammond's pod was lost over the Australian outback. He traveled to Junkertown, modified his escape pod into a walking mecha suit, and became a famous gladiator of Junkertown's scrapyard. To keep his identity a secret, he gave himself the moniker Wrecking Ball. As for Winston, his pod eventually led him to being found by Overwatch and joining the team. To this day, it's believed that Horizon's monitoring systems are still up and running, but there is no direct communication with the facility. The existence of Overwatch also gave rise to a clandestine terrorist organization known as Talon. Talon is an organization that seeks to make humanity and the world stronger through conflict. For years, Overwatch waged many operations against Talon, most of which were spearheaded by the valiant Gerard Lacroix. However, after multiple failed attempts to eliminate Lacroix, Talon sought a more subtle method, and so they kidnapped Gerard's wife, Amélie Lacroix. After kidnapping her, they proceeded to brainwash her, and it was through this manipulation that they managed to get her to murder Gerard, her husband, in his sleep. Thus, Widowmaker was born. Another noteworthy talent member was Akinjide Adeyemi. Adeyemi, the scourge of Numbani, was a war profiteer operating within the talent organization, carrying out raids on Numbani. Adeyemi recruited a disillusioned Nigerian boy called Akande Ogundimu, brought him into Talon, and trained him to become a mercenary. In Ogundimu, the inner circle of Talon saw the potential of a great future leader. In return, Ogundimu found great admiration in Talon's philosophies of creating a stronger world through conflict. As a result, the student had no other choice but to kill his mentor. Ogundimu murdered Doomfist the Scourge, and he took Adayemi's gauntlet. And with that, Akande Ogundimu became the third Doomfist. For years, Overwatch kept the peace, but peace is always challenged. Organizations such as Talon sought to test Overwatch's strength. Unfortunately for Overwatch, it seemed the greatest weakness would come from within. About eight years before the current events of Overwatch, Talon started growing more aggressive by attacking Overwatch bases. After an attack on an Overwatch facility in Oslo, Blackwatch agents Reyes and McCree went to convene with Agent Gerard Lacroix to gather intel at a Blackwatch base in Rome, Italy. After Lacroix revealed Talon agent Antonio Bartolotti as the mastermind behind the attacks, the base was bombed. Gerard Lacroix was injured and many other agents killed. Grieving at the loss of fellow Overwatch agents, Reyes convinced Overwatch Strike Commander Morrison to unofficially sanction a Blackwatch mission to go to Venice to infiltrate a Talon hideout and capture Bartolotti. This mission had to be off the books because Bartolotti had deep political ties and a front as a legitimate businessman. A Blackwatch team consisting of Reyes, Genji, McCree, and Moira infiltrated Bartolotti's base, but things went wrong, very wrong. Instead of capturing Bartolotti, Reyes opted to kill him in cold blood, much to the chagrin of McCree. The Blackwatch team had to fight off hordes of Talon agents in order to escape from Venice alive. The death of Bartolotti spurred replacements in the ranks of Talon in the form of the Omnic Maximilian and the third Doomfist, Akande Ogundimu. The Venice incident was a disaster for Overwatch. Because of the activity, the existence of Blackwatch was revealed to the world, called Overwatch's legitimacy into question. It would eventually snowball into Overwatch's implosion and dissolution, and what happened in Venice never sat well with McCree. Yes, um, I, I don't entirely blame them for what happened. Uh, no, look, I blame Reyes for shooting the guy, yes. But I mean, as in uh, the creation of Black Watch and it being a secret uh, and, and trying to go... Well, trying to bend the rules, if I can say that. And, you know, having Black Watch do these missions uh, against very important and influential people. Um, I don't entirely blame them that they have to take that path because, you know, the very governments that uh, the people have voted into power are also responsible 
they are also responsible for allowing uh, you know these criminal organizations and syndicates uh, to continue to exist and you know just turning a, a blind eye towards them because they're probably paying their pockets uh, giving them donation money for whatever elections they may have or uh, whatever lifestyle they want to lead so it, it's a messy situation it's a messy complicated situation um, like i said before i blame the governments of the world for not taking f much more responsibility in securing and keeping safe of their nations or their people you know they're leaving everything up to uh, overwatch to deal with and overwatch now needs to create a different organization uh, that would go behind uh, international laws and and uh, you know regional jurisdictions just to do something about a criminal uh, or a terrorist organization that's bombing and killing people you know this is something that the governments of the world should have been supporting Overwatch uh, in doing, you know, making new laws, uh, supporting them politically in uh, rooting out corruption. You know, they have to work hand in hand and understand uh, what's going on so that there will be better communication and they'll be having a far more understandable public when, you know, when you tell them that guys, there's a new organization called Black Watch and they're doing this one, two, three, one, two, three, uh, uh, you know, operations, black ops operations. But because there hasn't been any kind of uh, cooperation, it's just, you know, responsibility being piled on Overwatch to do everything. It creates this schism and this misunderstanding um, uh, between the public and uh, the organization Overwatch. So yeah, I blame the governments of the world. I blame the United Nations. I blame Overwatch as well uh, for not really doing enough in terms of informing the governments of the world or the United Nations that guys, this is a serious problem. You know, we can't uh, operate anymore without your political support, without your investigative support as well, you know, and, and the legal and uh, judiciary system also on our side so that we can get these guys so yeah one of the newer recruits to Overwatch after Retribution was the former test pilot Lena Oxton, aka Tracer. Oxton was a part of Overwatch's experimental aircraft flight test division. During a test flight for a new aircraft that could teleport called the Slipstream, the aircraft malfunctioned and disappeared. Tracer was presumed dead, however months later she reappeared, suffering from a type of phenomenon called chronal disassociation. With this chronal disassociation, Tracer's form could not stay anchored to the present time. Luckily, the guerrilla scientist Winston helped Tracer by designing a chronal accelerator device, allowing her to stay anchored to the present and granting her control over her chronal disassociation. This experience allowed Winston and Tracer to form a close bond of friendship with each other. Some 23 years after the Omnic Crisis, the extremist Omnic terrorist group Null Sector incited the conflict called the King's Row Uprising in London. London became a battleground. Hundreds were taken prisoner, including Mayor Nanda, the Omnic Shambali monk Mandata, and many others. Overwatch was forbidden from taking action, however, with assistance from from Blackwatch agent Jesse McCree, the area was scouted. Jack Morrison sent out four agents, Reinhardt, Mercy, Torbjorn, and the newest cadet, Tracer. Together, this group managed to end the King's Row Uprising. During the time of Overwatch's height, Talon Inner Council member Maximilian was out in the open in Havana, Cuba. With the Canadian hero Sojourn watching over the mission, Tracer led a strike team including Mercy, Winston, and Genji to track and capture Maximilian. Eventually, the strike team is able to block Maximilian's escape and capture him. Maximilian agrees to negotiate, but Mercy wants a specific introduction. Meanwhile, at the same time, Doomfist of Talon is addressing a mysterious, still unknown Omnic who could be a part of Null Sector. His identity and allegiances are still unclear to us to this day. Maximilian reveals that Doomfist will be in Singapore in three weeks' time. Winston, Genji, and Tracer then confront Doomfist, however they're no match for him. Eventually, Doomfist gets a hold of Tracer's chronal accelerator and smashes it to pieces. Winston, seeing his friend in danger, gets filled with rage and manages to punch Doomfist, capture him, and sends him to a Helix security prison, where he would be locked away for a long time. 
While Overwatch was highly revered, the group had plenty of critics. As time rolled on, rumors of Overwatch's activities seeped out to the public eye. This included rumors about the Black Ops division Blackwatch. There were accusations against Blackwatch regarding claims of corruption, not to mention alleged acts of kidnapping, torture, assassination, coercion, and gun running. It got to a point where these claims could not be dismissed as mere paranoid delusions any longer. Many of Overwatch's most famous and revered agents were forced to retire in disgrace as a result of these accusations. Ultimately, Overwatch's Blackwatch division was revealed to the public. As stories of Blackwatch's corruption were becoming more commonplace, public outrage against Overwatch was a powder keg that was waiting to go off. World governments started demanding that Overwatch be shut down. However, independent events ultimately conspired to destroy Overwatch from within. Meanwhile, in Brazil, the Vishcard Corporation apparently sought to help Rio de Janeiro rebuild after the Omnic Crisis, but the resulting efforts led to harsh restrictions and abuse of Brazilian citizens as cheap labor. Local Brazilian DJ Lucio Correia dos Santos was not happy with the treatment of his hometown and neighbors. He incited a rebellion against the Vishkar Corporation, chasing the entity out of his hometown after stealing the corporation's own technology. Regarding the fate of Overwatch, not much is known about what happened, but a cataclysmic event took place at the Overwatch headquarters in Switzerland. What was labeled as an accident in the public was actually a massive battle. It was a battle between two sides. On one side was Overwatch Strike Commander Jack Moore. Morrison. On the other, Blackwatch Commander Gabriel Reyes. The rift between Morrison and Reyes had been growing for decades. Whether it was Morrison being picked as the commander for Overwatch or the temptation of power, Reyes had grown corrupt. He sought to lead a rebellion against Morrison at the Swiss headquarters. The battle between both sides led to a massive explosion and the ultimate destruction of the Swiss HQ. This incident signaled the end of Overwatch. What became of Morrison and Reyes? They were believed to have perished in the explosion. However, neither of their bodies were ever found. It was the end of an era, in a flash, all that Overwatch had built was lost. The transgressions of Blackwatch were unveiled and the United Nations did what they felt had to be done. They dissolved Overwatch, and just like that, the Age of Heroes had come to an end. It was a sad end to a once shining beacon of light for humanity. Arguably, Overwatch became the very thing the organization had fought against numerous times, an agent of chaos. With the disbanding of Overwatch, the Petrus Act was signed into law. The Petrus Act declared any Overwatch activity illegal and punishable by law. Meanwhile, Morrison was memorialized in his home state of Indiana, and his teammates mourned his apparent passing. Yeah, wow, the end of Overwatch. Um, but like I've said before, it's not entirely their fault. I also blame the governments, but it seems to me that the politicians have thrown Overwatch under the bus and they've kept their jobs, they've kept their lifestyles, they've kept everything as if nothing really happened, uh, while Overwatch and its personnel have all either been killed or uh, they're without jobs, you know, they've been kicked out and the entire organization is also being banned. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just very sad, you know, what happened to them. And let's see what happens now. While the world enjoyed a period of untold peace and prosperity, with Overwatch gone, the floodgates were open. There was no longer a check against the criminal scum who sought to destabilize the world. Despite a wave of support for Omnic civil rights that had previously gained a great deal of traction, tensions between humans and Omnics grew yet again. The corporations that benefited from the aftermath of the Omnic crisis had grown bloated with power. Many corporations, such as Vishkar, had been engaging in rather unsavory activities to grow their political influences. Previously, Symmetra actually took part in espionage activities against the corporation Collado, of which Vishkar was competing to take control of the redevelopment in Rio de Janeiro. This led to Vishkar destroying a Collado building and causing extreme damage to a local slum. Kachavolskaya, the sea. And Brazil just sat down and took that. They didn't investigate. They didn't say, Vishkar Corporation, please leave. Our people don't want you anymore. Or, you know, during the, the, the disputes, of, of, of labor, uh, the remuneration of people, you know, why wasn't the Brazilian government saying, guys, no, you guys, you, you can't pay our people uh, peanuts, you know, you can't put them into uh, terrible working conditions. We have laws that specifically say that our uh, people will be paid that kind of specific minimum wage. 
and if you do not meet to that threshold then you're not allowed to do your business in our country you know something like that but we hear nothing from the government we just see these uh, powerful uh, multinational corporations uh, doing as they please and yet again I come back to the responsibilities of these governments where are they because they've been giving so much responsibility and power to overwatch they're doing the same thing with the corporations giving them the the, the ease of doing business in their countries at the expense of their own people you know hmm CEO of Russia's Volskaya Industries had also been double dealing under the table with unknown Omnics, something very taboo to the Russian government. With Overwatch's dissolution, Talon was given free reign to operate unchecked. Another event that increased human and Omnic tensions was the assassination of the Omnic civil rights leader and monk, Takartha Mandata. Mandata was a member of the righteous Omnic order called the Shambhali. The Shambhali order was formed after the Omnic crisis and it sought equality between humans and Omnics and it tended to heal the wounds caused by the war. While many started accepting the Shambhali's teachings and beliefs, the Shambhali leader Mandata was eventually assassinated by the one and only Widowmaker, despite a valiant attempt by Tracer to stop her. A few years after the dissolution of Overwatch, a second Omnic Crisis began in Russia. At the start of the present time of Overwatch, the second Omnic Crisis is still ongoing and has already claimed the lives of 15,000 citizens, but is isolated to the Siberian Omnium, and the international National community is reluctant. You see, they deactivated the Omnium, but they did not dismantle the Omnium, meaning it can still reactivate at any time. And that's why I'm saying all these other factories that are that are stationed across the world, you guys must dismantle these things. You must dismantle them. You guys cannot allow these things just to exist. You know, because at any time they can just reactivate and create new uh, Omnix, you know, or, you know, robots from the now sector. So, yeah to step in. Needless to say, the world is once again on the verge of annihilation. But much like before, when the world was in its darkest hour, it was not a world without hope. The age of heroes may have been over, but heroes never die. A masked vigilante emerged, foiling bank heists, but also stealing technology from Helix Security and old Overwatch facilities. This vigilante was none other than Soldier 76, the long-believed dead Jack Morrison. Gabriel Reyes had also survived, albeit likely badly burned or deformed. Something had happened to his physiology, causing his cells to experience constant degeneration and regeneration, granting him inhuman powers and turning him from Gabriel Reyes into Reaper. Talon has recently been escalating its activities. The CG short Recall depicted an attempt by the terrorist organization to steal a list of deactivated Overwatch agents from the Watchpoint Gibraltar base. Reaper led this operation, but was thwarted by former Overwatch member Winston. After his computer system AI, Athena, quarantined Reaper's computer virus, Athena's systems rebooted, lighting up the option to initiate the Overwatch Recall. And with the punch of a key, the Overwatch Recall was officially initiated, recalling many deactivated agents agents back to the field, and Winston re-established contact with Tracer. This action initiated the events of the main game of Overwatch. Meanwhile, in Antarctica, Dr. Mei Ling Cho woke from a 10-year-long cryostasis. Mei was assigned to a climate monitoring station to study Earth's escalating climate phenomena after the Omnic Crisis. Unfortunately, a polar storm struck the facility and the scientists were left stranded. May and her research team entered cryostasis in the hopes of survival before a rescue crew would eventually arrive. Tragically, the scientists did not survive their cryostasis, with May being the sole survivor. After she awoke from her cryosleep and mourning her fellow scientists, May re-established the communications in Eagle Point, Antarctica, allowing her to receive the recall message left by Winston, and she prepared for a long journey out of Eagle Point's base. Winston and Tracer's exploits continued as they thwarted Reaper and Widowmaker's attempt to steal the Doomfist gauntlet, which was housed in a museum in Numbani. Reaper also came masked to face with Soldier 76 during a confrontation in Egypt. The Talon associate Hakim was trying to set a trap for Soldier 76, but instead, 76 made a counterattack on Hakim's compound. During the battle, Reaper appeared and attacked Soldier. Both men revealed their identities, and just when Jack was about to be killed by Reaper, he was saved from certain death by Jack Morrison's former second-in-command, Anna Amari. Anna, much like Jack Morrison, had faked her own death after she was wounded in battle by Widowmaker, 
and lost her eye. Anna still managed to briefly incapacitate Reaper and remove his mask. Whatever Anna saw caused her to freeze in shock at what remained of her former friend and comrade, Gabriel Reyes. Reaper managed to get free and escape, warning Anna about what had been done to him, spurring her and Jack to reunite with a common purpose, stop Reaper and Talon. Coincidentally, Angela Ziegler, aka Mercy, was doing medical aid work in Egypt. In his conversations with Mercy, 76 reveals he's seeking the truth of what happened to Overwatch. Soldier 76 is well aware of Winston's recall message, but he seems to have no interest in joining Winston. He said, Let Winston play hero. I'll do what needs to be done. Mercy warns Soldier 76 that his personal revenge won't change anything, but Soldier 76 stubbornly believes in his brand of justice. Okay, Soldier 76, good luck to you. Um, yeah, that's all I can say right now. Good luck. <laughs> In the meantime, Talon freed and recruited Dr. Sebrin de Kuiper. Dr. Kuiper's life changed forever a few years prior when a gravity experiment aboard the ISS went sideways. The accident left Dr. Kuiper permanently insane and gave him the ability to control gravity. He was deemed unsafe and called Subject Sigma. Now with Talon, Sigma seems to continue his research, which Talon wants to use to further their agenda. Sigma wants to uncover the secrets of the universe, however it's believed that he's not aware that Talon is manipulating him to their own ends. In the I, I think they're both manipulating each other to their own ends, you know? They both need each other. Uh, and I'm kind of scared of Dr. Sigma, or what is Subject Sigma? Yes, I'm, I'm kind of scared of him and the experiments that he's conducting with gravity and black holes and stuff like that i'm really terrified <laughs> not only the fact that you know he has become uh I, I don't know if he's damaged like this permanently but you know he's come out mad in a certain kind of way and what if he's successful in creating this uh singularity that you know, can serve his purposes. What happens then? You know, what if there's a mistake and this black hole consumes all of Earth or something? So yeah, I'm I'm worried about what he's trying to do with his experiments, uh, using uh, a, a gravi gravity science and 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 trying to make these singularities and stuff like that. I'm really worried about him and his experiments. Uh, I would prefer that he would do all these things on Mars or maybe outside of the solar system <laughs> instead of doing it here on Earth, you know, no, no. In the meantime, Akande Ogundimu managed to escape from his confinement in prison. Even without his gauntlet, he was somehow able to punch his way out of his holding cell and killed more than a dozen guards. Talon assisted in his escape by bypassing the security systems where Doomfist was held. After his escape, Doomfist took a trip to Monaco to meet with another high-ranking Talon member, Maximilian. Maximilian affirmed his loyalty within Talon toward Doomfist, but advised Doomfist that others were moving against him. In Venice, Italy, Doomfist took out Viali, one of the high-ranking Talon members who opposed him. He and Reaper then sat in for another inner council meeting, and Doomfist announced his desire to start a war. Sometime after that, Doomfist went to Numbani to retrieve his gauntlet, where it was being transported to the Heritage Museum for a Doomfist exhibit for a Unity Day celebration in Numbani. Doomfist easily crushed OR-15 defense robots that were guarding the gauntlet. With his gauntlet back in his possession, Doomfist returned to Talon and his seat on the organization's inner council. I don't know why were they venerating this gauntlet and you know, exhibiting it to people. Why are you doing that? Why? Why aren't you destroying this weapon? I mean, guys, like, really? <laughs> uh, I mean, we, uh, governments that uh, collect guns from criminals, you know, or explosives, after they have gone through the proper process of uh, taking them into court or whatever else, you know, ballistics testing and stuff like that, they are destroyed. The weapons are destroyed. You know? So why wasn't this gauntlet also destroyed? Why are you exhibiting it like some sort of historical piece that needs to be celebrated? Hey, this universe. <laughs> Sorry guys if I'm, you know, 
you know nitty gritting this this uh, uh, universe of Overwatch. It's just that you know some of these things they could have been so avoidable if people just took a different stance. Uh, just like with the factories, the Omnion factories, if they had dismantled these things, then we wouldn't be having a second Omni crisis. This incident sparked the imagination of a young inventor from Numbani. After the assault on Numbani from Doomfist, Ifi Oladeli purchased OR-15 spare parts with funds from the Genius Grant awarded by the Adawe Foundation of Numbani. The parts were used to build Orisa, an upgraded and advanced OR-15 with the added touch of personality. Ifi sought to create a robot that would act as the hero Numbani needed, and fulfilled the initial well-meant intentions of the OR-15, and thus, Orisa became the true guardian of Numbani. In the current time of Overwatch, the second Omnic Crisis is in full swing. Talon is increasing its global efforts of destabilization and plunging the world into conflict. With Doomfist free, he seeks to take revenge on Overwatch for sending him to prison. Talon's plans to achieve strength in the world through conflict sound incredibly ominous. Thanks to Winston's recall effort, heroes are coming into the fray to stand against Talon, Reaper, Doomfist, and Widowmaker. One of Talon's newest operatives is the master hacker Sombra. Sombra is well aware of the underhanded shady activities of Volskaya Industries CEO Katya Volskaya. During an assassination mission, Sombra acted against Talon and opted to blackmail Volskaya with the information that Katya was trading secrets with the Omnics. In retaliation, Katya Volskaya activated the Russian soldier Zarya to presumably strike back against Sombra. Meanwhile, in the forests of Germany, a Bastion unit reawakened. In fact, the Bastion unit reawakened, the very last surviving Bastion unit. After seeing the aftermath of the Omnic Crisis destruction, the reactivated Bastion befriended a little bird called Ganymede and moved towards Sweden. Though the Swedish authorities seek to put a stop to Bastion, which has not yet made a move to attack any humans, former Overwatch member Torbjorn Lindholm volunteered to destroy it. However, Torbjorn noticed this Bastion's behavior was different. Seeing this new Bastion unit as peaceful, Torbjorn protected Bastion and Ganymede from the police, and the two traveled out of the forest together. Elsewhere, after leaving Overwatch, Genji managed to receive help from the Omnic Monk and member of the Shambhali Order, Zenyatta. Genji was not adjusting well to his cyborg transformation, and Zenyatta assisted Genji in finding balance and peace in his heart. With his new I think Darth Vader needed to visit this guy too. <laughs> really, Darth Vader also has, you know, this issue with his uh you know half human half mechanical uh cyborg kind of person so yeah he also needs to come to this monk and talk to him found outlook on life genji confronted his tormented brother hanzo when hanzo infiltrated the shimada facility it was part of hanzo's yearly ritual to pay respect to the brother hanzo had believed he killed the cyborg ninja forgave hanzo and encouraged him to leave his life of crime behind and step into the light will hanzo decide to join overwatch his decision is unknown but there is always hope after the fall of overwatch reinhardt wilhelm declared that he would come out of retirement and become a knight errant to bring justice to a world that no longer had Overwatch to protect it. Brigitte, with her father's blessing, joined Reinhardt on this mission and became his squire. For a time, Brigitte traveled alongside Reinhardt and would tend to his physical wounds and maintain his armor. After the events of Reinhardt's taking out the Dragon Gang and answering Winston's recall order, Brigitte could no longer sit on the sidelines. She finished work on her own set of armor with some help from her father. Brigitte Lindholm became a hero in her own right to fight at the side of Reinhardt and her friends to protect them and others in need to make the world a better place. The ex-Talon operative Jean-Baptiste Augustin became aware of Winston's recall message after trying to take out Vernon St. Clair, a pharmaceuticals magnate in port au with the help of two other Talon agents. The recall message gave him a renewed sense of hope. Seeing that Dr. Angela Ziegler was on St. Clair's stolen Overwatch data, he decided to pay a visit to Mercy to warn her, but first he contacted his old friend at Talon, the master hacker Sombra. 
Some years after Overwatch was abandoned, there was an attempt to transport Echo to a secure government facility, but that all went sideways when the train was hijacked by the notorious Deadlock gang and led to a showdown on Route 66, of all places. Despite the previous Blackwatch sting operation to take down McCree and the Deadlock gang some years back, the group was able to resume or maintain its activities under Ash's leadership. At the time of the heist, one Jesse McCree was waiting in the Route 66 diner and serving himself a nice slice of delicious apple pie when the Deadlock gang struck. He was aware of the heist and some of the payload was of great interest to him. McCree confronted Ash and the Deadlock gang, Bob included. McCree offered that the Deadlock gang take the rest of the cargo save for one mysterious glowing white spherical object. After Ash opened the mysterious container and saw what was inside, she wanted to keep the cargo for herself. A furious gun battle broke out, but McCree got the better of his former compadres. He tied up Ash and her deadlock minions and the remains of Bob on a mobile platform and sent them on their way. After that, he unlocked the container holding Echo, who had apparently been in storage for some time. Her exchange with McCree indicated he still had his left arm when they had last met. McCree informed Echo that Winston was reforming Overwatch, but he noted that while the team wants McCree, they in fact need Echo. After freeing Echo, McCree then left, noting that he had some business of his own to attend to, and the former outlaw rode off into the sunset on a hover bike. It appears- And, and this was one of the most beautiful uh, cinematics, especially like towards the end. Yeah, definitely. I really did enjoy this one. Is that Echo has some knowledge and association with Winston because of her surprise when McCree referred to Winston as a monkey and not a scientist. The circumstances are unknown how and why, but around the time that Winston sent out his recall message, the Omnic terrorist organization known as Null Sector began a coordinated attack on multiple points across the globe. One of those points was the capital city of France, Paris. With Paris in danger, it was time for Winston's strike team to act. Trace also, one of the best cinematics, this one, Zero Hour. I loved it. I loved the music. I loved how the team were all organizing together, fighting against uh, the Null Sector, Titan, Robot. I loved it. It was beautiful. Really. Tracer flew their dropship into battle to protect civilians from Null Sector's attack. Tracer, May, and Winston fought valiantly, but then a Titan-class Omnic showed up that seemed to tip the scales of the battle. Winston was ready to sacrifice himself to protect the civilians and his friends, but he was rescued by the arrival of several former Overwatch agents who heard his message and came to help. Genji, Echo, Mercy, Reinhardt, and Brigitte, all apparently showing up in the nick of time. These heroes had all heard Winston's call and were there to help. They were more than a match for the Titan unit and the remaining forces of Null Sector. Using teamwork, the team helped Tracer deliver a freeze bomb payload into the chassis of the Titan Omnic, which put it on ice for good, quite literally. The battle was over and the heroes answered Winston's call. The question was simple. Does this mean Overwatch is back? You're damn right they are. With the worldwide Null Sector invasion spreading, Null Sector launched another attack on Lucio's hometown of Rio de Janeiro. Lucio was there when the invasion began and set off on his own to protect his home. Luckily, Overwatch was also on the case, and the new strike team made its way to Rio to assist. Lucio quickly joined alongside Overwatch to help defend his city. Lucio took the team back to his home base and surmised that if they take out the Null Sector mothership, which is pumping out all the Omnic units, they can likely save the city. The strike team makes it aboard the Null Sector mothership and manages to overload the reactor. Our heroes make their daring escape just in the nick of time as the mothership gets blown into smithereens. So what's next? Overwatch is back together with a new ragtag group of heroes. While they won the fight in Paris, their war is far from over. We know from newly released information regarding Overwatch 2 that the conflict with Null Sector has spread all across the globe. Did Talon and Doomfist have something to do with this conflict? Considering Doomfist said he was ready to start a war before all this began, I think it's rather likely. There are many burning questions in Overwatch's history that are still unanswered, but the stage is set for Overwatch 2 and our new group of heroes. Until then, don't forget to subscribe to TGN and enable those notifications. Thanks everyone for watching, I'm Moxness, and I'll see you next time.
Okay guys, that's it with the complete history and law of Overwatch uh, made by TGN. Um, yes, this world, this universe of Overwatch, all, everything that has happened before, it is happening again. Yeah, let me say it like that. Everything that has happened before is happening again. After the, or should I say, during the Omni crisis, we had Overwatch <coughs> as an answer, right? The Omni crisis was, uh, uh, you know, defeated and the world was going into peace and reconstruction. Overwatch had new enemies to fight. New enemies came up uh, and, you know, started attacking, started attacking Overwatch started questioning the legitimacy of this group of this organization yes then uh, came the stories of corruption and you know mismanagement and uh, breaking of international laws by overwatch overwatch was uh, disillusioned and uh, also became dissolved after some time after uh, like a civil war between overwatch members you know the entire organization was disbanded now overwatch is back it's a new overwatch however the enemies that they've been fighting against are also back everything that has happened before it is happening again a new army crisis has occurred talon has returned stronger as ever and uh, overwatch has also returned you know, for part two of their drama between Overwatch and Talon. They're back. So, like I've been saying, everything that has happened before, it is happening again. And because of... I, I, I don't want to say... Okay, yes, the incompetency of the leaders of different countries across the world, uh, the incompetency of the United Nations, the incompetency of... Uh, the leaders of Overwatch, you know, leaving everything half done and not completed. They allowed these Omnium factories to continue to exist. Even though they said they've shut them down, they can still reactivate and new uh, Omni robots can be created, you know. When they should have dismantled these factories, they should have dismantled them, uh, take out the fusion reactors, bury them under the ground or take them into space do something with them you know instead of just leaving these facilities idle and thinking that nothing is going to happen that was one of the biggest mistakes that the united nations have committed uh the second one is you know giving uh the organization overwatch so much power so much responsibility uh delegating all of uh, national government's responsibilities in terms of protecting their people from terrorists, from criminal un, uh, uh, organizations, from gang members, uh, from uh, public uh, disorder, you know, relying on Overwatch to handle everything by themselves. That was also a mistake. Uh, Overwatch on their side, not really going hand in hand with the united nations in saying guys if you want us to protect the civilians if you want us to protect uh the world we need your support as well we need you to be there uh with your justice system to be there with your law enforcement to be there uh with your information and also dispensing information to the public telling them what overwatch is about the organizations that we have in Overwatch, even Blackwatch, it must be known by the people. It must be known by the people. So that they understand, you know, uh, uh, what's going on and that there's no surprise when, you know, they see something on the news about uh, Blackwatch operatives uh, blowing up this building or, uh, you know, having gunfights in this alleyway or something like that, you know. They need to be far more transparent uh, with the United Nations, they needed to be more transparent with the public. You know, put them, get, put them in your confidence, get them into your confidence um, uh, as the public to say that, uh, you know,
trust us. We we have your best interests at heart. You know, something like that. That was a mistake of Overwatch, not communicating well enough with the United Nations. The mistake of the United Nations giving too much power to Overwatch, uh, uh, delegating everything that in terms of security over to Overwatch. So that was a mistake of, of their making. So, you know, making this new Overwatch, uh, fighting against talent, fighting against uh, the null sector, it is just repeating the same mistakes that they've uh, committed uh, before. Because yes, they can defeat uh, the null sector, they can defeat Talon, but there's going to be a new uh, organization being built from the ashes of the other ones that have been defeated. And I think the only way uh, for the United Nations to deal with this matter is if they really put emphasis on uh, the different nations, on their own security in the, in their governments, you know, the police, the investigative uh, police uh, uh, sectors, you know, like your FBI or your, C your CIA or your, um, what do we have in South Africa? <laughs> uh, the Hawks, you know, put more emphasis on your community police, put more emphasis on your own local investigative directive instead of having this huge umbrella that is Overwatch that is meant to be the police uh, uh, of the entire world. No. If you do that, if you just throw away your responsibilities and give it to one organization, it will just breed corruption, it will breed uh, uh, incompetency and uh, also nepotism. Uh, you know, people getting their family members to become Overwatch members because it was their dream. After they've seen their parents becoming Overwatch members, they also want to become Overwatch members. No. <laughs> no. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the story of Overwatch is quite interesting. I really do like it. I really do like it. The fact that I'm talking about it like this, you know, it means that I am interested in it. Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not just saying this because I hate Overwatch. I, I'm just saying uh, the things that I'm saying because you know I'm interested uh, in knowing how things have turned out this way for Earth and turned out this way for the people of Earth. You know, and what creates this Overwatch uh, ecosystem. You know how how the world has come to be this way that has resulted in the creation of Overwatch and the continuation of Overwatch. That's what I like. I like it when um, the story has something that can make me think about uh, uh, the possible solutions or the possible problems, you know, the possible threats. That means it's going to be stuck in my mind. I'm not going to forget about this. But if it's just a story that doesn't have that kind of depth in it, you know, in terms of me wanting to think about it, then you know, then there's no point in me remembering it. But definitely Overwatch is something that I would remember. And I still say that they should make like a TV series or a movie based on Overwatch because really it's good. It's really, really, really good. <sighs> Guys, that's it. That's it for today. Um, if you like my reaction, please give me a like, comment and subscribe to my channel. Click on the notification bell if you want to be updated with my latest videos and remember if you want to check out the original video as well as tgn uh youtube channel the links are in the description below okay bye, -bye.